Well, good morning, friends. It's good to be together to worship God and uh, to look into his word. And, and we've been doing that over the last couple of weeks as we've been looking at the scriptures and saying, what on earth am I reading? What is the word of God all about? I clearly remember the day I got my first cell phone. It was a flip phone, a lot like this. A Motorola StarTech, pay as you go. And I got it from my sister. She was working at a tech store at that time, uh, like Radio Shack. And she bought it for me. What a deal. $10 a month, 25 cents a text. Um, the only problem was, the only way you could actually send a text was to, to kind of press the buttons and kind of spell out and search for the letter that you wanted. And if you missed the letter, you'd have to go all the way around and come back to it again because there was no reversing it. And so it was nearly impossible to send that awkward text. And I remember thinking at the time, why would you do that anyhow? Wouldn't it just be easier just to call someone? Way simpler. Well, my phone is great. It was a great phone, incredible reception. The thing was bulletproof, um, uh, but it really was limited. It could only do one thing well, make phone calls. And you wonder, isn't that what a phone is supposed to do? Well, my, my smartphone today does so much more. Unbelievable. It's a computer. It's an entertainment system. It's a multifaceted communication device. It's the world's largest library and research tool, and it's even waterproof. Here's the problem. I don't know how to use my phone. I don't know half the stuff on this phone. You know, I need to take a course or I need to take a workshop or I need to talk to an eight-year-old about how to use my phone. Um, have you ever had somebody who says, who shows you something on how to do something on your phone and you think, oh my goodness, if you had only told me this like five years ago, my life would have been completely different. Well, I thought about my old flip phone this week when I was thinking about how people treat the Bible. People approach the Bible like it can only do one thing well. And, 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 that's, and regardless of what reason they have for picking up their Bible or what they're looking into or what they have on their mind, they approach the Bible in the exact same way and they treat every verse in the exact same way. Like the Bible is, um, it, it only can do that thing, kind of like a dictionary. A dictionary is only for looking up definitions. A novel is only for telling stories. A cookbook is just for recipes. But the Bible is so much more than one dimensional. And when you discover all that the Bible is and all that the Bible offers and how God speaks to us through the Bible, you'll come to understand that there is nothing like this book. Nothing like it at all. Over the last month, we've been looking at the Bible and trying to answer the question, what on earth am I reading? And as we've done that, we've seen that the purpose of the Bible is to make known to us who God is and to lead us to a living faith in Jesus. That was week number one. Then we focused on the authority of the Bible, which comes from an understanding that it is the inspired word of God. It's not just an opinion, it's divine revelation. The Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit, transmitted through human authorship and personality, and it's been preserved with incredible accuracy and translated into every generation, one after another. And the Bible you can have confidence in as it leads us to live the Christian life as we come under submission to its authority. In week three, we saw that the Bible is a story. It's an, it's an epic, ongoing, life-changing, eternity-shaping, culturally alternative story of God's redemptive plan for humanity and for all of creation. It's a story that is more true, more complex, more honest, more beautiful, more hopeful than any story ever told. And then last week, Jay walked us through an overview of the Old Testament where we saw that there are different styles and different uh, genres of writing, that, uh, at least six different ones. And these different styles require different methods to study and to teach and to understand. First, there is the law, the first five books of the Bible, 
where God sets out for his people and he sets his people apart and he commands them how they were to live and worship and govern themselves. Then we had the historical books, which give us the actual events that took place in history through which people lived through. And so much of the historical book is narrative, it's story. And we've used that to adopt and make many times children's books or movies or, or fictional books out of those historical narratives. But they were actually people who lived in those days. And, and it shows us, the Bible reveals to us our, their character of, of who they were as they sought to live out their faith during those specific times. Then we encounter poetry, which gives uh, cultural expression and creative expression to people's emotions and senses. And it reveals to them, um, as they reveal what their perception of God was, who God is and what's my relationship with him. And the entire book of Psalms is a book of poetry, which became the song book for the people of Israel. Then we encounter wisdom literature, which provides insight about the meaning of life and how to live. The best example for this would be the book of Proverbs, which is filled with short and wise observations about life, all seen through the lens of God's revelation. As a teenager, I remember I took up the commitment, in addition to whatever else I might be reading in the Bible, I would read one proverb, one chapter of Proverbs every single day. And um, what corresponds is there's 31 chapters in Proverbs, so there's one for every day of the month. And I would read one psalm a day, and then I would read something else. And that was absolutely life-shaping. Just filling your life with wisdom from God's word. We also see speculative wisdom in Ecclesiastes and Job as as those books really kind of delve into the deeper matters of life and faith. And then so much of the second half of the, of the Old Testament is filled with prophecy. And prophecy is God's direct word to his people. It reveals his promises for those who follow him and warnings for those who do not. Finally, there's apocalyptic literature, which is a, kind, a different kind of prophecy. It uses symbols and metaphors and images to describe things that are really undescribable. It's about history, the present, the future, all from a spiritual cosmic perspective. Where is it all heading? What will it all be like? And metaphors are the best way to describe that. And you take all of that material, three quarters of the Bible, and it all leads to Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. The New Testament begins in Matthew chapter 5 with Jesus saying of himself this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It's not an accident that over half the Bible is the Old Testament. In a very real sense, we actually can read the Bible backwards because the New Testament helps us understand the old, just like the old leads to the new. There's a complete unity in the midst of both of them. And in Luke chapter four, Jesus goes into the synagogue in his hometown and he reads to the people from the Old Testament, from the book of Isaiah, and he chooses a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And after he reads it, He rolls up the scroll, hands it back to them and says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He himself understood it was all about him. The Old Testament leads us to Jesus and is fulfilled by Jesus. And my point in reviewing all of this is to show the necessity of understanding where you are in the Bible as you read it. What part of the story are you in? We need to understand the the various styles and writings and literary literary genres throughout scripture and the historical context in which they were written so that you can understand the Bible better and not try to make the Bible say what it never intended to say. You don't read poetry like it's prophecy. You don't read wisdom literature like it's law. That will get you into trouble. When Proverbs 15, 17 says, it's better to eat vegetables in a house filled with love 
than to eat a steak served by someone who hates you. God is not talking about what should be on the menu for supper. It's not about food at that point. He's talking about the priority of healthy, loving relationships. That's how wisdom literature works. The law tells us what God requires us to do. Wisdom tells us how life operates. We shouldn't mix them up. Likewise, when we come to the character sketches um, throughout the, the, uh, the historical books, and we assume that just because Jacob had two wives that polygamy somehow is okay, don't assume that. We have to understand what it meant then so we can understand what it means today. If you're going to study and teach the Bible accurately, you must be consistent in your commitment to the dual functions of exegesis and hermeneutics. Those are really big words. What do they mean? Exegesis is understanding what the text meant back then, and hermeneutics is understanding how the text relates and applies to people's lives today. It's a lot to remember, but it basically just means this. We have to learn what did it mean back then? And then we have to say, how does it apply to us today? Is there a universal principle here that is consistently backed up by the rest of Scripture? So we have to have one foot in the past and one foot in the present as we turn the pages of Scripture and seek to live out what it says. And I actually think that, that preachers and teachers and authors often get this out of balance. Some of them are so focused on back then. That's where they spend all their time. They love word studies and theology, but it doesn't relate to life at all. You might read an entire book or sit through an entire service and at the end just kind of say, I have no idea what that was about. You learn a lot of facts or you learn, maybe you learn a lot of uh, uh, little nuanced quotes or understandings, but it doesn't apply to your life Monday to Friday. On the other hand, uh, there are those who, who are all about what's going on in my life today. And so the Bible revolves around me and my circumstances and my situations. And we interpret everything through our present circumstances. But a really good rule of thumb is that a text can't mean today what it didn't mean back then. And so we need to have both good exegesis and good hermeneutics. What are the Bible principles and what are their implications for my life? And we bring all that to the New Testament. By the way, when you hear Old Testament, New Testament, testament is a Latin word that simply means covenant. It's about a sacred promise. So, when, so there was an Old Testament or an Old Covenant or an Old Promise that just result, revolved around God's relationship to his people Israel. And now there is a new covenant, a new testament, a new promise that revolves around Jesus' relationship with us. We get grafted in. The old leads to the new. And they're connected together. And as we come to the New Testament, the new promise, we I once again discover different styles of books that are arranged in a logical progression. First, we encounter the gospel. Open up your Bible to the, the, the New Testament and you run into the gospel of Matthew. And gospel simply means good news. The gospels record the life and the ministry of Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah who came to deliver his people from bondage. Mark begins his gospel with a bi uh, his biography of Jesus with these words, the beginning of the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God. The four gospels declare this good news about Jesus, the Messiah, but each one does it from a unique perspective. Each one of them highlights a different aspect of Jesus's ministry. It might be like you get interviewed as you leave, uh, if you leave church today or after the service and somebody asked you, what was the service like or what did you experience? Well, each one of us, even though we were part of the same experience, would have a little bit different perspective on it, a different take, maybe a different focus, what caught our attention. Well, that's what the gospel writers do. Matthew is first and, and he provides this seamless transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament and he is focused on Jesus being the Messiah. And so he starts with a genealogy that links Jesus to both Abraham and David. Mark has the shortest gospel 
And his was, in fact, written first. And he just wants to get the details out, just the facts. And he seems to be almost in a hurry to get it done. Luke and Matthew seem to build off what Mark wrote with greater detail. And the three of them are called the Synoptic Gospels, which means that their content overlaps significantly. That word synoptic just simply means to see together. Then comes John. And John offers many other stories and sayings from Jesus that are not offered in the other Gospels. He is deeply theological and he wants us to understand the divine side of Jesus, that he truly is God. And even though they're all unique, the Gospels tell the same story. They focus on Jesus calling his disciples and beginning his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. That's where so much of the Gospels take place. And Jesus attracts large crowds. He performs incredible miracles. He demonstrates with his power that he truly was who he said that he was. He has power over sickness and nature and even the demonic. And his popularity continues to rise and rise and it creates jealousy with the leaders and the religious establishment who conspire to kill him. He eventually is betrayed, arrested, beaten and crucified as a common criminal. But there is so much going on spiritually. Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. He's teaching us how to live in the rhythms of God's grace and he's making our salvation possible. It's not happenstance. It didn't just come about. It's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It just undergirds all of it. And on the third day, he rises from the dead. All four testify and, and, and tell us um, of, of that Jesus not only lived, but he died and he rose again. And he appeared to many disciples before he ascends to heaven, leaving us as the church, as his people to carry on his mission until he returns again. After the Gospels, we come to the book of Acts. And Acts provides the historical account of the spread of Christianity uh, and the early church, first starting in Jerusalem and then on to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, just as Jesus said. This is the result of the Gospel. In fact, Acts is Luke's second writing. So the author of the Gospel of Luke wrote the book of Acts as well, and it's a continuation of his gospel intent. Officially, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. And, and it begins with 120, a small community of people gathered together in Jerusalem, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come upon them and to empower them as Jesus had commanded them. And the Holy Spirit is so connected in the book of Acts, so active, that it really could be correctly called the Acts of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples or upon the apostles. The book of Acts details for us what it means to follow Jesus as Lord. It provides a description of life in the early church and a prescription of how the modern church should pattern ourselves. After Acts comes the New Testament letters. These are also called epistles. And there are 13 of them written by the apostle Paul to different churches uh, that he had planted on his missionary journeys and to some individuals that he had met. And again, they're arranged not chronologically, but simply in order from the largest to the shortest. Starting with Romans, ending with Philemon. Then there are eight general epistles or general letters from different authors. These are letters from Peter and John and Jude and James and the author of Hebrews. And the New Testament letters are meant to encourage and strengthen the readers regarding their faith in Jesus. It's a keep going. He's with you. This is how to live out your faith. Very detailed teaching. And at times they address some specific problems. Often Paul is writing in response to reports that he has received or questions that they have asked. Other times the letters are a little more general in nature. But all of them are meant to encourage uh, the, the, the believers to remain steadfast in their faith and keep Jesus at the center and the foundation of their lives. They combine teaching about God and the, and the gospel with instructions on life and behavior. 
And they show us what Christ-likeness looks like lived out every day in the midst of the context in which we find ourselves. And these letters are written to certain people in specific situations. And there are many, and, and sometimes there are problems in the early church that need to be dealt with. What's interesting is so many of the problems they are dealing with are problems we deal with today because it's human nature. And we get wisdom on how to respond to them. And the letters all follow a certain pattern. There's this kind of general greeting that takes place. And then there's a hymn of proclamation about who God is. And then the author begins to get into some specific matters in teaching. And that's why the epistles lend themselves so much, so easily to expositional teaching, where we unpack and, and uh, look at the details of the text. That would be different if you were, if you were telling a story from one of the gospels or if you were dealing with uh, wisdom from the book of Proverbs. And so our teaching styles and methods should change even as the scriptures that we're using changes. But when it comes to the epistles, they break down so beautifully for us over and over again to help us live more like Jesus, godly and holy lives. And finally, the New Testament ends with the book of Revelation, which is J the apostle John's vision of, of the coming of God and his establishment ultimately of his new creation. It's the end of time and it's a fitting conclusion to the New Testament because, and to the entire Bible because it shows God's ultimate defeat of evil through Jesus and the eternal dwelling of God the Father with his people in a new heaven and a new earth. It is our hope and it's our destiny. It's not, the, it's not, by the way, the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which was given to John through a vision while he was on the island of Patmos. So it's a vision of who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing and why we can have hope and trust in Jesus. And it's not many revelations. It's one revelation. It's a revelation of who Jesus is. And the book focuses in on the end of history and the victory that comes when Jesus returns to bring judgment and break the curse and establish his eternal kingdom. But the book contains much more than just a battle scene with Jesus ushering in the new heavens and new earth. It contains incredible hope and encouragement for us today as we live in the midst of persecution and struggle and difficulty. It tells us that there will come a day when death will be no more. There will come a day when every tear will be wiped away, when what we struggle with and suffer with because of the curse will be put to an end. And we wait for that day to come with hope. And it's also a reminder that God is sovereign. He is supreme and he will be victorious in the end through the work of Jesus Christ. And consequently, believers should persevere knowing that he is with them. And the story has a good ending and a great reward. And that really is an overview of the story of Scripture. And we see how beautiful and diverse it is and yet how connected it all it remains. It's God revealing himself in his redemptive plans for those that he loves. It's God providing salvation through faith in Jesus as we know him as the Messiah of the Old Testament. And now we live in the New Testament age and we are able to use the scriptures to live lives that are godly as we follow Jesus' example and his instructions and the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. And so as you read through your Bible, as you open it up, as, as you come to different texts, always remember what on earth is it that you're reading? And I really hope that as we've walked through this series, uh, it's inspired you to dive into the scriptures and begin to read the Bible for yourself with confidence that the Bible will speak to you plainly and clearly. And I want to give you some suggestions on how you can read uh, and study the Bible for yourself. And they're quite simple, but they're really important. And the first one is this. Learn to read the Bible quickly. And this is what I mean. You want to grasp the whole concept of a book or of a passage it's important to know the content, where the story is going. So read the entire thing. When you come to a passage, read it, read it through entirely. Maybe it's a chapter. You read the entire chapter. But don't just stop there. Go back and read it again. And go back and read it again. 
and read through it so you get the bigger picture of what God is doing. And when you come back to read it again, that's when you can actually start to say, what are the details here? Go a little deeper with God. In some ways, it's almost like handing him a highlighter and saying, is there some verses here or some phrases here? Is there something you want to say to me personally through your word? Something that the Holy Spirit wants to highlight. Second, learn to read the Bible slowly. It is the inspired word of God. We should come to it with reverence and with gratitude. The Bible should be read carefully and meditated upon. You might just take one verse or one phrase and just sit with that for your entire quiet time or carry it with you for your entire day and just be reminded of the truth of that one phrase. Meditate on it over and over again so that you can understand it well and how it relates to your life today. Slow down and let the stories come alive for you as you read through the Gospels or the Old Testament narratives. Even enter into the story, if you will. Imagine it in your mind. What would it have been like? What would it have been like to experience that? What might God be saying to you in the midst of it? Don't be afraid to use your imagination. Don't be afraid to know what you know. Go slow through the story of scripture and find yourself there. Study it and reflect upon it. Third, read it Christologically with Jesus in mind. Because the Bible's not about us. It's about Jesus and God's redemptive plan through Jesus. All of scripture should be related to Jesus. He is its fulfillment. He gives us his spirit to believers so that we can understand it. He provides us the ability and the power for us to obey it. He embodies the hope that we take from it and the comfort that we receive through it. It all, all ultimately comes back to Jesus. And finally, Read the Bible prayerfully. When we come to the Bible, it's almost like before you open the Bible, you just need to settle your heart and say, God, I'm here to speak with you. And I'm giving you the first word in my life. So often we come through the door uh, into, the, into the throne room of heaven and we've got all kinds of things we need God to do. All kinds of things we want to talk to him about. But, when, but it's so important that we would just say, God, you first. And when we come to the scriptures, God, you first. God, would you help us to believe what we read? Even when it challenges us in some of our narratives about ourselves and about you and about life. And Lord, the parts that we do understand so well, would you empower us and equip us to obey your word? May it transform us, may it wash us, may it cleanse us. The, the goal is not merely to know God's word, it's to know God through his word. Second Timothy, one of the last letters written in the New Testament in chapter two, verse 15, it says this, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. That's what God does through his word. He equips us and he empowers us to understand what it is what we're, that we're reading. That's what God wants for you, that you would handle God's word truthfully and with accuracy. So here's the challenge for you. I'd love for you to get into the Bible and to simply read the Bible. There are eight weeks between today and Easter Sunday. Why not read through the entire New Testament between now and then? I've done the math. It'll take you about 15 minutes a day. I would suggest you add 10 extra minutes so that you can actually reflect on what you've read. But if you just want to read it, 10 to 15 minutes today, a day, just reading through the Bible, uh, reading through the New Testament. And to help you, We've actually divided the Bible up into 50, the New Testament up into 56 different days, the number of days between now and Easter Sunday. And we've printed them off and we simply have a reading plan that's available on the information tables at each of our sites. Uh, and it's also will be available on the resource page for our teaching series for this, uh, for, uh, that's on our website. 
So I encourage you, just pick it up today and then just start reading. And every day that you read, just put a check mark. And we've kind of divided it up so you go through the Bible chronologically and thematically as you read through the entire New Testament. But you don't have to follow the plan we put together. You can, you can just open up the scriptures and say, God, I'm here. Speak, because your servant is listening. Maybe you want to get together with someone else, a friend, someone at work, someone in your family, and just hold each other accountable to get into God's word. Maybe it's as simple as saying, you know what, that seems to be too much. I'm just going to start with one chapter of Proverbs a day. And then get together and not only say, did you do your reading? Um, say, what did you think of what you read? What troubled you? What, what excited you? What did you understand from that? And begin to read the Bible together. Get into the Bible and, le and let the Bible get into you. Let it inspire your faith and shape your character and fill your heart and transform your life. This is God's gift, God's word for you and me. Let's pray now and just give thanks for God's word before we come to the communion table. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of this book. And we confess that so often we uh, have neglected it. We've neglected to read it, to study it, and to obey it. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, put within us a passion and a hunger for your word once again. We see it as a gift to us. And, and Lord, may it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. May it strengthen us for our lives. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means, and the will to put it into practice. And we pray all of this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We talked about all of scripture leading to Jesus. And so I think it's very appropriate that we finish our time today by coming to the communion table. It's a response to this story of grace. As we come, we come for multiple reasons. We come to celebrate, to remember, and to declare that Jesus is our Savior through his death and resurrection. We have been given new life. We come to remember his sacrifice and the salvation that he makes possible. We come because Jesus invited us to come, not only to come to the table, but to come into divine friendship with him, to come into spiritual freedom that's made possible through his unending love and his complete work on the cross. And we declare as we come that Jesus is coming again to establish God's eternal kingdom. In the gospel of Luke chapter 22, it says, when the hour came, the hour came and it's referencing Jesus going to the cross. Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table and he said to them, I eagerly desire to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And so he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And remember the word covenant is best understood as a promise, a sacred agreement. And in the Bible, there's covenants all the way through. And whenever a covenant was established, uh, in the ancient world, there would be this, this pattern where you would have to seal it with signs of the covenant. That it would be a binding promise, that it was a serious commitment. And so um, as part of establishing a covenant, often an animal was sacrificed. Or there was a recitation of blessings and curses, depending on how people followed and fulfilled the covenant. There was also the eating of a covenant meal and there was a memorial that was built to remember it. And using those symbols and pictures of the Old Testament, Jesus now says, this is the new covenant that I'm establishing in my blood. This is the fulfillment of that Old Testament promise. However, in contrast to the Old Testament covenants, which had many conditions on them, the new covenant is unconditional and undeserved. It's a covenant of grace and love made possible through Jesus going to the cross for you and I. 
And Jesus' actions at the Old Testament, uh, sorry, at the Last Supper, draw, drew on the important elements of this biblical symbolism about covenant. Image and symbolism, it's really important in communicating truth. Because as people, we have multiple senses. When you hear um, someone teach from the Word of God, it, it involves your ears, your listening, so it's the sense of hearing. And you learn that way. But what is so wonderful about the communion meal is that it involves all of our covenant, all of our senses. We, it communicates the truth about Jesus through, our, through sight and sound and touch and taste and our own participation in it. We're completely involved in this dr- dramatic divine drama that communicates an eternal truth about Jesus. And we're all active in participating in it. And that can have an incredibly powerful effect on us as we remember Christ's sacrifice together. So this morning, how we're going to participate in communion is by inviting you to come um, to one of the tables that are set up uh, at each one of our sites. And you're going to come and you're going to take some juice and some bread and you're going to return to your seat. And when you come back to your seat, you can take it there with with others in your row, uh, on your own or with family or however you would want while we continue to worship together. In the physical act of coming to the table, you're demonstrating to God your spiritual desire to draw near to him. And so you come humbly and expectantly and with, a, with an understanding that we don't deserve his love and his grace, but he gives it to us anyhow. Remembering that Jesus does not treat us as our sins deserve. He, he treats us so much better. He forgives our in, uh, iniquities and he remembers them no more. So take the bread and the cup as a reminder of the grace and truth and peace and hope and forgiveness and relationship and freedom that is all ours through faith in Jesus Christ, the one who loves us more than we could possibly understand. And use this meal not only as a chance to say, God, I need you in my life, but to say, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. And I just offer myself afresh to you. Um, we want everyone to participate in communion. And so uh, today, if uh, you would prefer not to take from the actual uh, plate with the bread in it, there are some double cupped pre-served ones that you can pick up and take those. There's also some, simply some water here if you'd like to partake but have some, um, have some dietary restrictions. But as you come, imagine yourself feasting on the goodness and the grace of God remembering that Jesus drank a bitter cup in order to provide for you a sweet one. So before we stand, I'm going to invite the worship teams to come and to prepare themselves. And I would like you to stand with me now uh, at each one of our sites and in the cafe. And we're going to give thanks to God and we're going to pray uh, to him uh, now and give thanks to him. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, as we come to this covenant meal today, we come with humility and grateful hearts. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us on the cross. As we prepare to receive this bread and this cup, we ask for you to be present with us. May this moment be a holy moment of deep communion with you and with one another. Forgive us our sins and cleanse us in our hearts and renew our spirits, we pray. And help us to approach this holy moment with reverence, understanding the depth of your love and grace. May the bread and the cup be for us a tangible reminder of your sacrifice and all that you have done for us. And as we partake, draw us close to you and to each other, becoming more and more like Christ in our thoughts, in our words, and our actions. Dear Jesus, thank you that like these symbols, you allowed yourself to be taken and blessed and broken and given for the salvation of all who believe. We come now in faith and gratitude. In your holy name I pray, amen. When you're ready, you can come.